Starting in the 1970s, the world moved from communicating through copper to glass, and that demanded a series of breakthroughs. The optical fiber network connecting our world is a technical marvel. Light bouncing from one end of the world to the other in case is some of the purest glass in the world modulated to carry billions or even trillions of bits per second. In this video, we talk about how optical fiber helped connect the world. In 1933, a boy named Charles Gao was born in the city of Shanghai inside the French concession. Fleeing the chaos of the Chinese Civil War, his family moved to British Hong Kong. Charles then traveled to the United Kingdom to do his studies, eventually receiving his PhD in electrical engineering at the University of London. Then in 1960, Charles joined Standard Telecommunications Laboratories, the research arm of Standard Telephones and Cables in the United Kingdom. At the time, the world and their telecom carriers sent electrical signals through copper wires, but the world, even just through phone calls, thirsted for more bandwidth. Telecoms thus turned to millimeter wave transmitters. Millimeter wave transmission uses extremely high frequency waves, some 35 to 70 gigahertz, to send data at high rates. It is today used in 5G networks with somewhat iffy results. The telecoms were installing chains of relay towers, beaming microwave and millimeter wave signals from one point to the next. But people soon realized that the atmosphere absorbed too much of the waves to make a good point-to-point -point signal. You needed a waveguide, a medium that can facilitate the travel of those waves, like how a paved road makes it easier to drive. At around this time, news arrived of the invention of the laser. One of the first uses people envisioned for the laser was in communications. Theoretically, they can replace all those point-to-point -point relay towers. Light held so much potential for data transmission, if not simply on the basis of its frequency, 3000 terahertz compared to microwaves' 3 gigahertz. Yet Charles's cohorts quickly tried the technology only to dismiss it. Glass fibers and the term fiber optics have been around since the 1920s. They were even used in 1954 to convey images with light. But when scientists tried firing laser light through fiber optics to send data, it didn't work. Unless the fiber was perfectly straight, there was too much light lost. The fancy term for that is called attenuation, and it is measured in decibels per kilometer. Imagine a glass window. You can easily see through it, right? Most glass windows have an attenuation of 200 decibels per kilometer. Make a glass window a few meters thick, and you could barely see through it. Charles decided to stick with it, and after many simulations and experiments, a breakthrough. He concluded that attenuation was largely caused by external impurities in the glass, particles of copper or iron, rather than the glass's inherent material properties. He published his findings in a 1966 paper, Dielectric Fiber Surface Waveguides for Optical Frequencies. In it, he said that if you get the iron and copper impurities to less than one parts per billion, then the attenuation would not be 200 decibels per kilometer, but 20. In other words, if the glass is pure enough, then you can see through a window many miles thick. Few people noticed Charles's paper at the time of its posting. Most people were focused on satellites as the future of communications. But Charles persisted in bringing his idea around the world. It didn't take long for him to be proven right. A team at the glass manufacturer Corning, led by Bob Maurer, took on the challenge. Corning has made optic fiber before, but never with glass this pure. Through experimentation, they stumbled across a method. You place a mixture of precursor gases inside a tube and then spin it around quickly while running a heat source over it. The gases react together to create silicon dioxide gas, and then that silicon dioxide gas crystallizes onto the tube's inside as a solid, pure, fused silica glass. This procedure is now known as inside vapor deposition, and it is still used today. After enough time, you get a solid glass rod called a preform. Then we take the preform to a drawing tower, which can be many meters tall. It heats the preform, just the tip, and then pulls down a fine strand of pure glass. 
1970, Corning announced the creation of a pure fused silica fiber with attenuation of just 20 decibels per kilometer. Further attenuation improvements were made by other teams, and with that, optical fiber began connecting the world. Modern optical fiber is a flexible strand of plastic or glass capable of transmitting light from one end to the other. We want to send some data, like a digital picture of a corky in a bathroom, over a fiber line. The digital picture exists in the form of ones and zeros. We then take a laser's light and modify, or modulate it, in a variety of ways in order to encode those ones and zeros. Then that light goes into the fiber. The fiber is made up of two components, a central core that is about 10 to a few tens of micrometers wide, and a 125 micrometer thick cladding that surrounds it. The fiber's core has a higher refractive index than the cladding that surrounds it. So once inside the fiber, that light internally reflects back and forth at the boundary between core and cladding. That modified light will basically internally reflect throughout the optical fiber, ideally its whole length, and then exit without any power loss, even if the optical fiber bends and curves. These light pulses not only travel at a very high speed, 70% the speed of light, but they also do not suffer heat losses nor latency delays due to electrical resistance. That first ultra-pure glass that Corning made back in 1970 could carry 65,000 times more information than copper wire. In April 1977, General Telephone and Electronics installed in Long Beach the first commercial telephone line powered with fiber optics. That single one-inch wide optical fiber carried as much data as a 2,100-strand copper cable, four times its diameter. But first-generation optical lines had attenuation, causing the light signals to deteriorate over distances. So they needed, quote, repeater stations to regenerate the light signal. This involved receiving the light signal, converting it to electrical signals, and then reconverting that into light again, OEO. Then in the second half of the 1980s, a team at Southampton University in the United Kingdom was studying fiber sensing how variations in the temperature surrounding a fiber affects how light travels through it. From there, they had these experiments where they mixed rare earths like neodymium and erbium into fiber cores, which caused them to emit light. Add some mirrors to the fibers, like with traditional lasers, and fire some light through these cores, and you get some very long lasers. Which was cool because it's lasers and all, but nothing particularly useful. It took some time before they saw the real killer use case. Take off the mirrors and the team realized that they had boosted a light signal within a fiber by 30 decibels. Unwittingly, they invented the erbium-doped fiber amplifier. In 1986, Bell Labs adopted the amplifier, allowing them to amplify the light and send signals through long stretches of fiber without needing to have so many repeater stations. The Southampton team won the 2008 Millennium Prize for their invention. It was a significant breakthrough in optical fiber adoption that not only greatly improved fiber's economic prospects, but also exploded its capacity limits. These amplifiers not only boosted a single wavelength, but multiple ones. This made it practical for the telecoms to transmit even more data through the same fiber using different light wavelengths that won't interfere with each other. Wavelength Division Multiplexing. So we have multiple lasers modulating data in those different wavelengths. Then before sending them into the fiber, we combine them together using a thingamajig called a multiplexer. The telecoms have long known about wavelength multiplexing, but never before implemented it because the repeater stations would also have to split all those wavelengths again before regenerating them. Not practical. The optical amplifiers changed all that, and by 2001, the industry was regularly putting 80 wavelengths on a single fiber line. If each of those wavelengths has a bit rate of 10 gigabits per second, then that whole line suddenly has total bandwidth capacity of about 800 gigabits. This was a major breakthrough, allowing us to do far more with the same fiber. In 1980, we used optical fiber to transmit images for the first time carrying pictures of the Winter Olympics at Lake Placid. 
14 years later, optical fibers were carrying video images for the first time, carrying video back from the Winter Olympics in Norway. Most of the world's data infrastructure on land is modular. This means information might hop from one city to another, and that modularity makes the network easier to build and maintain. But it is a different story for the cables that must plunge under the water and span entire oceans, undersea cables. It costs a lot of money to lay down and maintain an undersea cable, sometimes billions of dollars. The first submarine cables used coax technology using a copper core to carry electrical signals. But as voice bandwidth demands grew, the technology strained to keep up. Notably, they were getting fatter, which made them harder to produce and maintain. For instance, the 1976 TAT-6 cable, which went from the United States to Europe, was 2 inches thick. And around $180 million, it also cost twice as much as the previous cable, TAT-5. Worse yet, the cost curve valued on a per-voice circuit basis was not trending in a particularly good direction. TAT-6 cost twice as much as TAT-5, but its $45,000 per circuit cost was more than half that of its predecessor, indicating slowing coaxial technology progression. Facing a significant challenge from the satellite providers and with landline fiber optics already in the market in 1977, AT&T took a chance on fiber optics for their next cross-Atlantic submarine cable. They spun segments of fiber, 5 miles each, and spliced them together to 20-mile long segments, which was how far apart the repeater stations would be. Then, work had to be done to adapt existing submarine cable housings for the new fiber optic material. After a series of extensive tests and sea trials, AT&T laid down TAT-8 in 1988 with two optic fibers carrying 280 megabits per second or about 40,000 simultaneous phone calls. There were some initial issues with sharks attacking the cables near the Canary Islands. The cables were not properly insulated and the electric fields attracted them. But the $335 million cable drastically cut per voice circuit costs tilting the weight of the industry away from the satellites and back to cable again. Then came the internet boom of the late 1990s. Data rate needs skyrocketed. Throughout the decade, internet traffic in the United States doubled every year into 2001. That's amazing growth, of course, but nowhere near the oft-cited statistic of doubling every three months. But like any good urban legend, it did once have a basis in fact. It was apparently true during an unusually fast period of growth from 1995 to 1996. That was a different time and going off a far smaller base. Nevertheless, the phrase circulated like a chant, even showing up in a 1998 U.S. Department of Commerce report. In response to this perception of massive demand, the telecoms spent billions of dollars to build and light up national long-haul fiber networks. Leading companies during the boom include Level 3, which at its peak was installing about 19 miles of fiber each day, or Quest, which began as a telecommunications subsidiary of Southern Pacific Railroad. They took advantage by using railroad rights of way to cheaply lay down fiber. Or Global Crossing, a telecom company founded by a bunch of bankers. They were founded in 1997 and just two years later was worth $47 billion. Another two years later, they were worth just $2 billion, eventually filing for bankruptcy. That was a wild ride. And of course, Enron and WorldCom, which are known for being some of the largest accounting frauds in corporate history. At the peak in 1999, the telecom spent $120 billion in $2,000, worth about $213 billion today in capital expenditure. Much of this was funded by billions of dollars of debt, which eventually became a problem. After the dot-com bubble burst, a long-lasting glut hung over the industry. Four years later, in 2005, it was estimated that 85% of the fibers were totally dark or inactive, and just 5% of the capacity was being used. This dark fiber was a great opportunity for the rising tech companies like Google. One of their big initiatives in the early 2000s was to buy dark fiber to connect their own server farms and save on long-haul data transport. For a better overview of the fiber boom and glut, I highly recommend Doug O'Loughlin's piece on the fiber glut in Fabricated Knowledge.
Today, most installed fiber can handle up to 50 terabits per second over 10,000 kilometers. That's great, but thanks to the rise of social networks, the cloud, and streaming, current capacity is straining again, and unfortunately, current fibers are nearing their theoretical capacity limits. So we either need to build a lot more fiber again, or do something entirely new. And one of the more exciting recent developments in the latter is Space Division, or Spatial Division Multiplexing, or SDM. Like Wavelength Division Multiplexing, which we talked about earlier, this is where we send multiple signals over the same fiber path. The difference is that with SDM, we send the signals over multiple spatial paths in the fiber rather than wavelengths. Light has different ways of moving through space. They can move the same way, but in different frequencies. Most fibers right now installed are called single mode fibers, meaning that the light can only travel through such a fiber in one way or mode. So we can create special fibers called multi-mode fibers that increases the number of modes, maybe even a hundred or more. This is done through making changes in the fiber cores refractive index. Or we can make single fibers with multiple cores sharing the same cladding, which was previously avoided because it tended to encourage what we call interfering crosstalk. And since light can have the same mode but different frequencies, we can layer on traditional wavelength division multiplexing for even more capacity. There remain challenges. Multi-mode fibers right now suffer from distortion and power loss issues at longer distances so right now they're best suited for shorter spans. And the cores need to be thicker to accommodate the light's differing spatial paths. But the gains are big, with the potential to 10x again the bandwidth capacity. In 2009, Dr. Charles Gao received half of the Nobel Prize in Physics for making the discoveries leading to our modern optical fiber networks. He passed away in 2018 at the age of 84 after a long struggle with Alzheimer's disease. A life well lived, indeed. Nowadays, fast internet data access is a critical contributor to the betterment of human life. It is worth some time to look back and consider the remarkable infrastructure undergirding this massive transfer of data across continents and under oceans. And we are still pushing its limits today. It's a stunning technology, and it leaves me a little lightheaded. <laughs> Alright everyone, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time.